A ravaged land does make a ravaged man. The world is stripped of its resources, and monstrosities roam the earth. And where traveling together isn't always the answer to keeping safe, especially when it's your own body that simply has a mind of its own. Loveliest of listeners, today I bring you an author's tale, and I really love these. In fact, I haven't done one of these in ages, and always get excited when people reach out to me with their stories. So, a big thank you to Lucid Crater for today's two tales, De Santros and Isle of Screens. A slightly Eldritch-inspired story for sure, and a creepy story involving static. For my Patreons, I'll include the drawings that the author sent through regarding the creatures, so you'll get to see the visualization of these monsters straight from the author's mind. And I won't lock it behind a paywall, folks. You know that's not how I roll. Check it out by going to my Patreon page, and you can see the images there. And a huge thank you to my three white tea warlords, Matthew J. Bauer, Maya, and Divided by Zero. And of course, my old gray enforcers, Chad Warren, Just Heather, Lee Bauer, Lorraine Crescento, Mace Joe, Paige Marcini, and Peter Raffaelli. Just brilliant people doing brilliant things. Thank you so much for the support. Also, I came home today, and a cat legged across the road from me, straight to me, meowing and began doing roly-polies and playing with leaves. Now, it won't stop following me. I may have acquired a cat, folks. Goodness. I'll give you an update on this later. And lastly, I'm drinking some new tea called Just Organic Fair Trade Black Tea. It's actually really nice. Grabbed it from Aldi, and it's super inexpensive, but tastes really good. It reminds me of a stronger Earl Grey, less floral and more earthy. But it ain't no Russian caravan. So check it out and try it for yourself. I reckon you'll like it. Now my awesome listeners, turn the lights off, the sound up, and... Stay quiet. I think, I think one of these things is in the same room with us. Shit. Hello, my name is Carlos Estavos. At the time of writing this, I am currently a 26-year-old male from Phoenix, Arizona. Or at least I was for part of my life. It's hard to explain my current predicament if you are from a far future where these beasts no longer roam the earth, or perhaps you are a traveler from a faraway planet who stumbled upon this on a voyage to this now dead planet. It doesn't really matter who you are or where you're from. It doesn't matter to me, and it shouldn't matter. Nothing matters anymore. I would like to think that in all my years of being an artist, that the bizarre nature of these creatures that lay just outside this small building I now hide in would in some way be comprehensible. But the pure, eldritch construction of these creatures and their Rube Goldberg-like configurations boggle the mind of even the most talented designer who ever lived. Does a name, a combination of words or syllables, of consonants and vowels known to exist within the range of the human tongue come close to even scraping the surface of these creatures. I don't know. I don't think there is. Even if there was, it wouldn't matter now. To keep my sanity in some way, I've tried to make a name for these things, though I know in reality it's a futile attempt to make sense of the senseless. I've called them De Santuros Muertos. Mostly because if I didn't tell myself they were the living dead, I might go crazy just trying to comprehend them. I don't exactly remember when they got here, on Earth. In fact, it's been such a difficult process to determine the days passing ever since they arrived. I counted only 45 days till I lost complete count. I don't know how long it's been since. The sky above me doesn't give any sign. It's always this grey, overcast, Clouds completely covering the once blue sky above. Occasionally, I catch glimpses of the sun being a little brighter in certain areas of the sky, but I've completely forgotten how big or small that ball of light really is. And I don't know why it's this way. At the very least, I have my own theories. 
I've seen their machines. The giant crystal constructions that hang perfectly still high in the sky. This perfect diamond shape that seems to reflect a dark, bluish green light similar to the ocean. One of them hangs directly over Tuxen, right in between Saguero National Park and Mika Mountain. They hang just below the clouds, which seem to circulate like a slow brewing storm right at the tip. If I had to guess, either the clouds are generated by those machines, or they have an impact on the weather around them. It was there, from those things, where the first of the De Santos emerged. I didn't see the initial reveal myself, but out of those crystals came these enormous creatures the size of a skyscraper. I remember the first time I saw one, and ever since I haven't been able to get the image of it out of my head. It keeps popping back into my mind at the worst times, and I've found it hard not to think about them when I'm trying to do something like drawing. It looked like this. See my notes, for an example. It was the top half of this extremely anorexic humanoid figure. I could see the bones of its ribs and spine, and shoulders and everything almost poking out of its thin, rotting skin. It looked pale, a sickly light grey, like it had died years ago. All of its hair was gone too, though it didn't look like it even had hair in the first place, if that were the case. What seemed a little more bizarre was that the bottom of it, around the pelvis, were what seemed like fragments of bone that were sharpened from what I can only assume was it constantly crawling to get around. Its arms were proportional, looked like they were mostly bone, and the digits of its fingers were similar to the fragments at the end of its body. But that wasn't the most disturbing part of it all. All around its body were exposed strips of what I could only presume were muscle and other organs. It looked like the muscle had been ripped from underneath the skin and pulled tightly around the frame of the body. It had a death grip around its fingers, on both of its biceps, and around its throat. It also did this to the bottom of it, covering all of the shards of bone, as well as the head. I could actually see, for only a short amount of time, while it's been shambling by the skull, was slightly dented in where the muscle had wrapped over. Clearly, the thing couldn't see with normal eyes, but it seemed to almost not rely on any eyesight. I don't know how it was detecting movement, but it seemed to be moving with a purpose. These things seemed to have some deep purpose behind them, though the only thing I could tend to see is their incessant need to feed. They constantly are looking through buildings and walking through streets in search of something. I know what they want. They want humans. They want human meals. I watched the apocalypse unfold with my own eyes, and I saw how those things reacted to any human in the area. The other day, while I was passing the time in the remains of a coffee shop, I was stopped by the sound of shouting and gunfire. Curious, I decided to investigate, only to find a group of survivors trying to shoot down one of these things. They failed horribly. It seemed almost impenetrable to gunfire, moving faster and seemingly unfazed by the bullets, bouncing off its thick hide as it closed in on the useless group. Its hands rose up high and slammed down on about three of them, shaking the ground so hard I could feel it all the way from my cover. I knew it wasn't safe there in that moment, so I decided to run while I could and hope this group would be a fair distraction in my escape. I kept glimpsing back as I ran, noting how the thing picked up the barely living people and either swallowing them whole or tearing right through them with razor sharp teeth that would most definitely have pierced its own skin if it were normal that is sure the great ones can freak you out 
they cause the majority of the chaos that you'll find nowadays. Be it tearing down buildings or consuming whole teams. But what truly surprised me were the smaller ones. I came across them by accident one time while I was crossing into Los Angeles. Luckily, it wasn't a pack of them, like you tend to see, but just one, a loner. I was camping out in one of the various hotels around the area, trying to use the crowded environment to my benefit in hiding from them. As I was hiding out for the night in one of the hotel rooms, I heard this sliding, almost scraping sound coming from outside my door. Afraid of what may lay outside, I slowly made my way to the peephole where I saw it. It was just like the giant versions of these creatures, but now exactly my own size. Its entire top, from its collarbone to its elbows, was covered in the bandage-like strips of organs, constricting its arms against its chest like a snake killing its prey. Its head was nearly mush from how hard the bandages constricted in an asterisk formation. While its legs were bent, making it around the height of the door, if it were standing fully upright, its feet were also taped off, causing it to be bow-legged in the process. The creature was pacing around my door, constantly stopping right in the middle before shambling to one side then coming right back seconds later. I don't know how I managed to get out, but luck happened to be on my side. I kept still as I opened the door and hid in the bathroom. It took the invitation and ambled its way inside, stopping right as it got to the bathroom. It seemed to be looking around the area with a sense I could only guess was either smell or hearing. It was only a few feet away, still outside the bathroom and looking to the right of me, and just stood there for what felt like an hour before walking forwards and out of the way. I quickly jumped into action and ran out of the room, reaching for the door to slam it closed. As I moved, so did it. It whipped its head around to face me before getting in an inhuman stance and jumping for me. Luckily, the creature wasn't quick enough. I could hear it slam against the door behind me before slumping to the ground with a wet thud. I didn't want to look back inside. I just left. I ran. I didn't care to ask what that was or what happened. I just ran. It should have stayed that way. There's a reason they look undead. I was with a group of travelers I happened to meet right outside of the hotel as I ran. They immediately pointed weapons at me, rightfully so, before demanding to see if I was bitten. Hey, is he bitten? I didn't understand what they meant, but they were persistent. When I revealed that I was completely unharmed, they simply lowered their weapons and apologized. Sorry. At my own request, they allowed me to join their group, stating that they needed another hand. It would only be an hour later that it turned out to be a bad decision on my part. The next morning, completely awake, I now walked with them as they cased a department store. We carefully went in, guns pointed in all directions as we ventured deeper. I don't remember what they were looking for, or what was even the cause of the argument that happened to arise from two of the group members. All I could remember was when one of the creatures emerged from the dark. The sound of the argument, I could only guess, drew its attention as it jumped on one of the men and sunk its teeth into his neck. Surprisingly, a single shotgun shell resounded. A single shot hit the smaller one, blowing its head clean off. I thought it was all fine, until the group suddenly pointed their guns at the man who was bitten. They were clearly afraid to even think of shooting him, but it seemed as if it didn't matter what they wanted. I saw how the transformation happened. Oh god. He was shaking violently, screaming in immense pain as he grabbed where he was bitten. It was expected for him to be in pain, but unexpected when he suddenly began tearing at the bite. He was trying desperately to rip off his own skin, fighting back with the force of a hundred men, but it didn't matter. Suddenly, a piece of his own flesh tore from his back and shot across his face, muffling his screams. As it began to constrict his movement, 
two more strips protruded from his forehead, ripping his skin and causing blood to burst from the exposed wounds. I remember him looking at me with those eyes, those terrified eyes of a man who had never experienced the fear he now felt. One of the other men in the group had the decency to finally pull the trigger and end his life, causing the man to fall backwards upon the corpse of the dead creature who bit him only moments prior. The death only provided us with temporary comfort as we heard two more of the creatures shuffling in the distance. I couldn't bear to be there anymore, and I ran. I didn't stay to watch the second attack. I didn't stay to watch them all get devoured. I just ran for my life. I ran for what felt like hours until my legs finally gave out on me and I collapsed. I don't know how long it's been since the first of those crystal structures arrived on Earth, nor do I know just how many people have died from these creatures. All I know is that I'm alive and that I have to run. It's still cloudy outside. I know some people may hate the rain, and some people may hate completely hot, cloudless days. But anything, be it rain, hail, sleet, snow, even blue skies, would be better than this. I just wish things would change. I don't know who's going to read this. I don't think it's going to matter at all. I know it won't. I just need something to keep my sanity before I break in two from the monotony of the sky. This sky is going to kill me. Somehow, that sky will kill me. A story written by Lucid Creator Isle of Screams In a blurry haze of white noise, you awaken to find yourself in an unknown location, a forest to be exact. The construction of this place seems as if it is like any other tropical forest. However, you truly have no idea where you are exactly on Earth. Aimlessly, you decide to venture forth into the unknown woods ahead of you. The noisy blur you awoke with seems to hang heavy in the atmosphere, distorting your sight and hearing. However, it is eerily quiet in this forest otherwise. Suddenly, as you are walking along, you spot something in the distance. Approaching the figure reveals it to be, bizarrely enough, an old CRT television. It's lodged into the dirt and covered all over in vines. Age clearly shown on its frame. Only its screen remains safe. However, you slowly notice another one just a short walk away from it. And then another, and another, and another. You keep finding more and more TVs, old and lost to time, each one with their own unique weathering or destruction. Obviously, the sight makes no sensible pattern, but slowly, the collection soon rises up until it forms into a wall. There before you is a mountain of old TVs, stacked haphazardly atop one another. They each are visibly distorted, or damaged in some unique way. However, all of the screens are surprisingly untouched. It is when you approach this pile that the noisy distortion that followed you begins to grow. You start to hear a static white noise growing in volume all around you as your body begins to shake with anxious confusion against your will or better judgment. You feel your head begin to get heavy, spreading your legs and ducking down as you grab your pulsating mind with both hands. Your vision is getting blurry as the static radiates more violently, and that's when you begin to see it. On the screen before you, one by one, the TV screen flickers onto dead static, each one emitting white noise of a slightly unique frequency. Your breathing wavers as you stagger to stay upright, looking over the display before you in a mix of fear and confusion as a drop of sweat forms on your forehead. You can't stand the noise anymore. It's driving you crazy. You are going to lose your mind like this, with faltering vision and legs nearly giving way. You stagger before charging at the TV most directly in front of you. 
and send your fist directly into the screen. It shatters instantly upon impact, bringing the single screen to silence while the others continue. You take a few uneasy steps back as you look over your damaged arm. Shards of glass sticking out of your hand. Blood begins to seep out of every cut. But as you look upon the damage, you see in clear detail your blood begins to shift and change before your eyes. It bloats and crackles, changing from dark crimson into black and white squares. You can't stop your arm from shaking as the static grows. Slowly, the static engulfs your vision completely. All you can hear and see and feel is static. You collapse as you fall victim to the static's pull. Both of these stories were just great. Thank you so much, Lucid Creator, for both these stories. You have a unique style and captured the visual component of these monsters very well. Looking forward to more of your stories, buddy. And if you, a listener at home, have your own stories, write them down, send them in. I'll review them quickly and get them up on the airwaves. Lickety split. Don't be worried about quality at all. If you think it's not good enough, send it in to me anyway, and I'll take a look. Don't be a stranger. If you have story recommendations, again, send them right to me, and I'll take a look and shortlist those that I think will be great. This Friday, folks, I'm going to delve into something a little different, and I'm working on giving some no-sleep books away, so stay tuned to score yourself a free horror novel to add to your collection. So brilliant listeners, stay brilliant, which isn't hard for you guys and gals, and as always, till next, we meet. We called it the sleep of the dead. Day 6, Friday. See, I'm doing my best to update daily like Dr. Chen said. She didn't seem pissed that I missed a few appointments. That's good, because I was kind of worried I'd be in some kind of trouble. She just seemed interested to hear about Nicole. I must have talked about her for nearly the whole session. I had to stop myself a couple of times because I started talking kind of fast. I felt pumped full of adrenaline. I told her that Nicole wears a braided necklace around her ankle, just like the ones that Dr. Chen has around her tiny wrists. She smiled and said, they're good luck or something like that. More encouragement to update the journal. Will do. Am doing well. See? Day 7, Saturday. Called Nicole today. She said she was in work and couldn't talk. No problem. I went to the coffee shop and waited for her lunch break. We drank coffee and talked. Oh, she really is great. We have the same taste in music and movies and most things. I felt ready to tell her about my appointment with Dr. Chen, reassuring her I'm not dangerous or anything. I just did a stupid thing. She was so understanding. I felt like a huge weight was lifted off my shoulders when she smiled her beautiful smile at me and said that she looked for a counsellor herself. Wow. After a car accident a couple of years ago, and thinks counselling is really helpful, and that she's never heard of Dr. Chen. Turns out she's into some alternative therapies too. Whatever. It's cool. Day 6, Sunday. Spent the day with Nicole. Was supposed to work on a college assignment. Whatever. Nicole is more important to me right now. We shared a lot. I explained a bit about my frustration issues and some of my angry outbursts. She seemed cool with it. Oh, she's so awesome. She gave me a little clay creature thing. I called it a gargoyle, and she said it is actually called a grotesque. It is an ugly little bastard, but she says it will protect me if I keep it in my dorm room. She has one too. A pale goblin looking thing made out of cool white stone. It is much creepier. I am planning to tell Dr. Chen about it. I reckon it will be right up her street. The hairs on my arms and neck stood up as waves of goose pimples ran across my body when I read this light and cheerful entry. In the really bad days at the end, 
I remember Pat mumbling to himself about the grotesque. Just the word itself still sends a shudder down my spine. And this is where we'll stop for now. I'll continue this in the next episode of Wednesday, you brilliant people. Just fantastic, folks. I'll be continuing the grotesque this Wednesday, and I can't wait to find out the rest of this story with you. Currently, I've been experimenting with audio filters, removing breaths and whatnot, and gotta say, still learning the process, but I'm getting it down pat. What this means is, there may be some quality loss initially in this episode, but next episode, I'll have it perfected. I used an audio gate in this episode, which uses a bunch of frequency filters to cut off breaths, which is amazing in itself, but I think I may have been too harsh on the filter. New gear, new software means new kinds of mistakes, but I always keep learning. Plus, this technology is fascinating. In the end, I'm going to create a better experience for you guys and gals, so stick with me Wednesday, where you'll hear the difference. And once again, a big shout out to my awesome White Tea Warlords, Matthew J. Bauer, Maya, and my new White Tea Warlord, Divided by Zero. Seriously, you've made my week, month, and year. And I got this Patreon message notifying me of your support whilst I was sick. One of the highlights of my week last week, thanks to you, buddy. Amidst all the illness, it was refreshing, so cheers. And of course, I have to thank my Earl Grey Enforcers. Chad Warren, Just Heather, Lee Bauer, Lorraine Crisanto, Mace Joe, Paige Marcini, and Peter Raffaelli. You keep the lights on and the show's blood pumping. Thank you so much. If you want to support the show just like Divided by Zero did, hop onto my Patreon page, www.patreon.com forward slash sfgt. It's that easy and take a look around. I customize at all tier levels. You just have to reach out to me. Thank you so, so much for any support you listeners send my way. Whether it's reviews, comments, likes, and just listening. Really, thank you very, very much. Have a great Monday, mates. And as always, till next, we meet.